delivering this topic on control resistance to consensus in the management of hypertension. I am thankful to Cadilla Pharmaceuticals for giving me this opportunity. You will all agree with me when I say control resistance are very common in hypertension and a consensus is always elusive. If at all the only consensus that can be achieved is to continue with the controversies. <coughs> with this brief introduction, I would like to start my talk and this will be the brief outline of the talk. A few words about the Indian scenario, how to measure blood pressure, a few words about the ADPM, what are the guidelines and their pitfalls, a few words about the trials and finally a few details about the special cases where hypertension plays an important role that is diabetes and chronic kidney disease and I shall conclude my talk with a few words on chronopharmacology. Then coming to the Indian scenario and the prevalence of hypertension in India. There is not much of a difference between the urban and rural India as regards to the incidence of hypertension is concerned. It hovers around 30 percent. But over the period of years, there is a steeper increase in the urban population becoming hypertensive. Despite all the efforts, the awareness about hypertension is still low in India, which is also evident with the lower proportion of patients achieving optimal BP control. Here you can see the prevalence is around 33 percent and uh, the proportion of patients who get BP control is around 10 percent only. Coming to a few words about the history and blood pressure measurement. In 1773, Stephen Hales was the first to measure BP. He calculated the carotid artery of the heart and the height of a column of blood after calculating, he made measured. And that is how he started this whole process. And to connect, they used a glass tube as well as the trachea of a goose. Well, 100 years later, a mercury manometer was used. However, again this also was an invasive procedure and it was connected to the artery. And then finally, in 1890, an Italian physician, Riva Rocky, invented the Spigmo manometer. Spigmo means pulse and manometer is pressure meter. Well, finally, a few words about what actually is blood pressure measurement. Here I would like to quote what Kaplan said. Kaplan said in 1998, the measurement of blood pressure is a clinical procedure of greatest importance that is performed in a very sloppy manner. And this continues to be so even now. Then coming to Indian guidelines for BP measurement. These are easier said than done. The patient should stay in a quiet room. You should take three readings with a gap of at least two to three minutes. Both the arms should be bound and the one should use the appropriate size cuff. Though earlier mercury was used, nowadays it is banned and hence you have to use the digital manometer. The patient should have abstain from smoking or drinking coffee or tea. These are said easier said than done. Well, it nearly takes 10 minutes and I could hear the rumble here. So with the 10 minutes, uh, we could have done so many other things. We could have seen the patient, we could have cleared some crowd and so on because most of us clear crowds. So what can we do? And before that, we should know what will happen if we do not do this. If we do not do this, we might end up with false diagnosis of 
hypertension in a normal tension individual. So this might result in overtreating and sometimes one might land up with problems related to overtreatment. So what I would suggest is you train your aid. Here I am clearly using the terminology aid, though I would very much like to use a trained qualified staff nurse who will not like a trained, qualified, beautiful, young, energetic, enthusiastic nurse assisting the doctor as well as the patient. The patient will be very happy, he will be relaxed, his DP will be normal. The doctor will also be relaxed. But unfortunately, it is not going to be like that because having a nursing aid in the OP is rather a luxury nowadays. So what you can do is you can train your aids and ask them to take the BP as stipulated like this. Then coming to ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. Ambulatory blood pressure monitoring gives you an idea of 24 hour average BP. In addition, it also gives mean values over definite periods, say in the morning, afternoon, night, or whenever the patient is active. And this ABPM correlates more closely with hypertension related organ damage and its changes by treatment than the office blood pressure measurement. In addition, one main important thing is ABPM can identify non dippers. Non dippers are people whose blood pressure does not fall in the night. Normal individuals have a dip in the night and these non-dippers are vulnerable for cardiovascular marbles and mortality. Then what are the indications for ABPM? Isolated systolic hypertension, white foot hypertension, borderline hypertension, nocturnal blood pressure, resistant hypertension, hypertension during pregnancy, hypertensive symptoms and again monitoring how you have controlled one's blood pressure. For all these things, one can opt to do ADPM and uh, these are some of the recommendations. What one should remember is that should be a clear bit with the night and uh, the awake BP optimal will be around 130 to 80 or 135 to 85. Then coming to some of the limitations. First, it is going to be cumbersome. No one is going to like a cuff getting inflated and deflated every 15 or 30 minutes when he is active. And then it's costly, definitely costlier than an young nurse taking your BP. And uh, whatever you may say, it is going to be intermittent, but it is not going to be intermittent ambulatory because after two or three cycles, the patient becomes aware of the fact that the next 15th minute it will again inflate. So what happens is most of the time the patient by the 13th minute slows down, goes to a withdrawn position or stays back relaxedly and starts his work again. So the whole purpose will be defeated. Instead of getting an ambulatory BP, you might get values of BP at rest. So these are some of the relative, uh, relative uh, pitfalls, but still ambulatory BP is a very good tool. Then coming to guidelines of hypertension, similarities and differences. I can I simply want you to go through the slides and I would like to just say I remember only one thing. Your cutoff BP should be 140-90 or can be 140-90. I don't want to be very dogmatic and say one uh, should be. Because you will find a bit this way that way, plus or minus. But the net result is everything centers around 140-90. And so you can remember 140-90. And one more thing you will find when you compare these guidelines most of the guidelines avoid beta blocker, but I strongly feel it, it should not be the case. And uh, as the Indian guidelines also include beta blockers, we have to include them. Only thing is, 
they need not take their place as a single or sole antihypertensive, but they have a definite role in combination therapy. And Indian hypertension guidelines are simple, straightforward. If you remember ABCD, you know what it is. And uh, A is for ARBs or A inhibitor, B is for beta blocker. Here again one word. You can forget adrenal because it has fallen into disrepute. So one should remember there are a number of other good new vasodilatory beta blockers, which can be these third generation beta blockers can be used and they are very useful. And then C and D is for calcium channel blocker and a diuretic. Here, the arbitrary cutoff is young individuals, each of the ARB, or you try to choose C and or D. The question is who is young, who is old? Indian guidelines say it is 55. But unfortunately, I don't think we, are, we would like to be called old when you are 60 or not. So, so I would again leave that option to you. You can be young if you are 70. So the question is, it is the individual who decides he is old or young. Because finally, when we close this talk, you will realize the treatment will be individualized. So, the age is again arbitrary. Then, should we use a single drug only? It's, it, it is not so. It is always preferable to go for a combination. The step care therapy of SWS, where you start with the drug, go to the peak, a dosage which you can tolerate or the patient can tolerate then add another one and so on this step care therapy is gone it is always preferable to use the combination therapy in fact whenever you get a blood pressure of 140 over 100 it is preferable to always go for a combination therapy which will be very useful Indian guidelines use fixed dose formulation because obviously this will improve the complaints will help the patient in taking the drugs regularly. As I told you already, Indian guidelines still mention and use beta blockers and uh, the diuretic of choice is clothalidol now. Well, why have beta blockers gone into disrepute? It is because of these two trials. One is live study where Lasartan scored over retinolone and uh, the other one was ASCAR BPLA study. Here, amlodipine scored over retinolone. But one should remember in both these studies it was retinolone which was used. But now you have newer beta blockers. These azodiretin beta blockers do not share some of the limitations of traditional beta blockers like Atimula. In fact, the saying is by Kim, among the third generation vasodilating beta blockers, Nebivalol may be particularly suitable as a first line single drug treatment for hypertension. It may be timely for treatment guidelines to recommend third generation vasodilating beta blockers as a first line option also. Well, coming to recent trials in there, practical implications. So because I am saying trials, I don't want you to rather uh, relax and close your ears because you know in the you you have a lot of slight statistical significance and so on. But uh, my aim is not to do that. My aim is only to skip through these slides and finally tell you what we have got to understand from these trials. First, we shall talk about the SPRINT trial. This was a trial in non-diabetics with increased CBD risks, targeting a systolic blood pressure of less than 120 mm of mercury. In simpler terms, instead of 140, they wanted to reach a goal of 120 mm of mercury systolic. And this resulted in lower rates of fatal, non-fatal, major cardiovascular events, and death from any cause. But when you go further, there were untoward effects also. Significantly higher rates of adverse events occurred 
in intensive treatment group. So what is the implication for us, for the practicing physicians about this? One should remember this was done in a very elaborate way, the blood pressure was recorded in a very different way. The patient was sitting in a room and uh, there is nobody else there. An automated BP apparatus recorded his BP every 3 to 5 minutes and 3 such recordings were taken. And the average of this BP was considered as the blood pressure of that particular individual. Future studies have clearly shown that this BP, what the sprint people got, was definitely lower than what we all get in the routine clinical practice. Where the patient comes to you, you just take his record, his BP and find that it is why you say he has hypertension. But sprint was not like that. Not only sprint, even the other trial, O3 BP trial, was also like that. So you should be very, very careful in recording the BP. And unfortunately, I don't think any one of us can do it. That is why earlier I said you should train your aid to do that. But still, if sprint is applied without attention to proper BP measurement, substantial over-treatment. And when you over-treat, there will be high rate of adversities. It is hence, are we going to do that? No. Probably it is preferable to hover around 140-90. But selected cases, one can try to carefully adjust. But this may be practical in institutions, but individuals I would still suggest your gold standard should be around 140-90. So what are the clues of the drugs used? One is, Slow salidone is the diuretic of choice. Amlodipine was the CCD of choice. And as I said earlier, they were reluctant to approve beta blockers. But uh, we are not so. We continue to feel and use beta blockers in combination therapy. Then coming to hope therapy. That is a hope study. The Again, I would not like to go into the details of this study, but the comments from the authors, it is very, very relevant. The comments is that our findings contradict the lower is better hypothesis. Earlier, people were saying lower is better, so try to lower as much as you can. There is nothing like uh, uh, keeping it around 140, let it be 110. We have seen people doing very well, but it is not so. So lower is not better. Then they added, our data are compatible with the hypothesis that treating patients without CVD who have a systolic BP of 140 millimeters of mercury appears to be very beneficial. But treatment would not be of benefit and may even be harmful in persons with lower systolic BP level. Then coming to special situations, diabetes and chronic kidney disease. Again, it is simple. I have condensed to these two statements. In diabetes, targeting a systolic BP of less than 120 as compared with 140 did not, again I would like to re uh, repeat, did not reduce the rate of composite outcome of fatal and non-fatal major cardiovascular events. So there is no need to try to reduce it. Even though there are people who say with albuminuria you can even try to reduce it to 130. Then finally a few words about chronopharmacology. Recent findings indicate cardiovascular disease risk is best predicted by asleep systolic blood pressure. This term is important, asleep systolic blood pressure and lowering it by scheduling one or more than one conventional long-acting antihypertensive at bedtime. It significantly lessens the vascular associated risks. 
Well, some 20 years ago, four controlled onset extended release drug delivery systems incorporating calcium channel or beta blockers with a treatment goal specifically the attenuation of mani rather than asleep BP were conceived as one type of bedtime hypertension chronotherapy where they wanted to control and prevent the morning early morning surge because they hypothesized early morning surge of blood pressure leads to early morning attacks of infarction and so on. However, the convinced outcomes trial failed to substantiate this merit of targeting morning and daytime BP to decrease the CBD risk. On the other hand, four trial entailing bedtime ramipril for high CBD risk patients showed substantial reduction in vascular related events. And again, another trial, MAPEC, it was prospective randomized treatment time outcomes investigation to treat the worthiness of bedtime hypertension control with one or more drugs. BTCT compared to CMTT, that is bedtime chronotherapy, was found to be superior and CBD associated morbidity and mortality as well as ischemic hemorrhagic stroke came down heavily. So all these things and there are a number of other ongoing trials. We are waiting for the results of ongoing hygia and other trials. When they come, we will have to consider planning our therapies. So in short, planning to give the drugs in combination at night to prevent the uh, BP from shooting up during night. Maintaining it, it, it is something like maintaining the deeper state. That is what is needed. Then coming to the conclusion, hypertension remains a condition of public health importance in India. Not only in India, throughout the world. Methodology to measure accurate BP should be given very much or due importance. ABPM is a useful tool, useful tool, but it has its own limitations, but probably in the long run it can be overcome. Although recent trials have provided useful information for lowering BP further, useful goals of BP should be followed. The usual goals, I said what is given in these various guidelines, but I have just put it as 149. BP goals can be lowered further in some special conditions. Say for example, if one has a CKD with protein area. Well, choice of drugs for controlling BP should be highly individualized. Till more data emerge, even in those of antihypertensive can be advised. And finally, we should try to get our own outcome trials, but it is easier said than done. On one point itself, we will fail. Simply recording blood pressure, I think definitely we will fail. Thanks a lot for your patience.